Okay, thank you very much. Uh, well, my name is uh, Dr. Elisha Kiprono Kirwa. I'm a consultant uh, and a sociologist here in Moi Teaching and Referral Hospital in Eldoret, Kenya. So I would like to welcome everyone to today's scheduled uh, webinar, whose topic is uh, perioperative management of anticoagulants. And uh, before we start, I would like to appreciate the uh, Kenya Society of Anesthesiologists for the webin uh, webinar organizing team for the great work. We would urge them to continue the good work of uh, educating us. We can all, we, um, um, I'm also uh, appreciating, we'd like also to appreciate all the participants who are present this evening, both local and uh, non-local ones, sponsoring us for this uh, witness. Uh, I would like to ask you, in case you have a question during the presentation, kindly write it or chat it down on the phone, and uh, we shall discuss it at the end of the presentation. So uh, today's uh, presenter is uh, Dr. Ian Ondari, who is a consultant and a sociologist based here in Kenya. He did his uh, undergraduate uh, degree at the University of Nairobi, that is Bachelor of Medicine and Surgery, and also went ahead to, his, uh, to do his uh, postgraduate uh, in masters, masters of Medicine in Anesthesia at the Aga Khan University in Kenya. He works, currently he works at the Aga Khan University Hospital as a clinical in, instructor and uh, his current interests include uh, pain medicine management pain medicine management regional anesthesia ambulatory anesthesia and uh, also procedural uh, sedation i would like to welcome our main speaker ian ondari welcome doctor for your presentation thank you thank you dr kira um, I'm humbled to be uh, the presenter of the day today. And um, thank you everyone for joining in to the webinar for today. Um, I won't be wasting any time. We'll just go straight to the presentation. And uh, the topic for the day is uh, perioperative management of anticoagulants. Uh, this topic is actually a very, very wide topic. And um, I'll try to do justice to it and just give the best basic principles of preparative management of anticoagulants. And uh, I hope uh, everyone will get uh, something to learn from it. So we'll just start. Um, so the objectives of the day uh, is to review recent literature on preparative management of anticoagulants, uh, review the current recommendation from uh, the recommending bodies and apply the guidelines that are recommended in, in our clinical practice. So, um, The common indications of uh, anticoagulation, uh, and, and this is this list is not exhaustive, uh, is one is stroke, um, the second is atrial fibrillation, and from Western data, the prevalence of actually atrial fibrillation is one to two point five percent, and the third commonest indication for anticoagulation, this is chronic anticoagulation, is mechanical heart valves. So the key considerations. So key considerations uh, when thinking about perioperative anticoagulation, uh, you'll ask yourself two questions. Well, one of them is, will my patient clot? And this is in literal terms. And will my patient bleed in the perioperative period? And one of the factors, uh, this can be looked at in three broad uh, topics, which is the thrombosis risk, the hemorrhagic risk, and the anticoagulant that the patient could be on at that moment. Um, so the, the thrombosis risk is basically based on patient characteristics. An example is venous thromboembolism, uh, history of venous thromboembolism, atrial fibrillation, uh, and, and et cetera. Uh, hemorrhagic risk could be procedural risk and also patient characteristics risk. And then anticoagulants is just dependent on what the patient is on. So there is uh, the hemostasis and International Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis uh, have released in 2019 um, the recommendation on the Scientific Standardization Committee uh, 
the recommendation on guidance on how to manage anticoagulants perioperatively. And this is a key tool in how we have implemented these guidelines and how we manage our patients uh, routinely. Uh, these guidelines are based on managing or balancing between bleeding risk and the thrombosis risk, like I mentioned in the previous slide. So how do we stratify our patients uh, based on the thrombosis risk? So the stratification of thromboembolism uh, risk by the American College of Physicians has described this in three main categories, which is high risk, moderate risk, and low risk of thrombosis in the perioperative period. And this is done on three major parameters, uh, which is mechanical heart valves, atrial fibrillation, and venous thromboembolism. And if you look closer at the table uh, that is displayed, um, if you look, for example, at venous thromboembolism, any venous thromboembolism be below three months or patients with severe hemophilia will be at high risk of thrombosis in the perioperative period. And if it's three to 12 months, it will be moderate risk. And if it's more than 12 months, it's, it will be high, sorry, low risk. If you look at atrial fibrillation, there is the Chad's vas score uh, that has been used to score. At times you can use the Chad's score as well. And any score above six will be high risk. Any score between four and five will be low with intermediate risk. And a score less than three uh, will be low risk for thrombosis. And the same, you can look at the uh, mitral valve. And this is a, a table you can always refer to when you're dealing with your patients um, and scoring them about on the thrombosis risk. So the Chad score, uh, there's the Chad score and the Chad vas score. And the, as you can see on the tables, on the table below it, uh, the Chad's VASCO has just uh, extra parameters that could be give you more accurate identification of patients with low enough risk to forego anticoagulation. But then it also gives you uh, better stratification of patients as you're scoring their thrombosis risk. You can see there it will give a different score for patients above 75 and also a different score for patients 65 to 74. So if you look at the table here, this is what you'll use to score the Chad's VAS score in the atrial fibrillation risk. Okay, so um, the next one is the hemorrhagic risk. And the hemorrhagic risk, uh, there are several ways of looking at the patient's uh, risk of bleeding during uh, a preoperative period. And these are patients who are on anticoagulation who need to be discontinued or, 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 or such. And uh, there are several scores that can be used to stratify patients on their bleeding risk. One of the most commonly used is the Hasblad score that is shown in the table below, which has several parameters and they score patients. And you can see on the right side of the table, uh, the, the risk per 100 patient years of getting hemorrhage in the perioperative period. So the H will be hypertension, the A will be abnormal renal or liver function, the S will be stroke, B will be bleeding, uh, L will be liable, labile INRs, E will be elderly uh, with a cutoff of 65 years, and drugs or alcohol use, which will have one point each. And uh, so the other way of stratifying bleeding risk for patients in the perioperative period is by the type of procedure they are coming for. And this is can be stratified into high bleeding risk, low bleeding, low to moderate bleeding risk, and the minimal bleeding risk. These uh, are procedures that have been studied and already documented to have uh, this particular risk stratification based on studies in the past. So if this is just a, a, a table that lists them and this table, anyone can refer to it at any other time of their own. If you look at some of the high risk procedures, it will include even anesthesia. When you consider neuroaxial anesthesia, that will automatically take the patient to high risk uh, of bleeding. Uh, then there is neurosurgery, um, major intraabdominal surgeries, and you can look at the moderate uh, risks, like most laparoscopies that we, we usually get involved in doing, and the low risk procedures like dental extractions with the uh, one or two teeth and other uh, procedures that are considered low risk for bleeding. So when you're thinking about anticoagulants, anticoagulants are largely into these three groups, antiplatelet agents, agents, vitamin K antagonists, and dual oral anticoagulants. And some of them are listed there. Uh, the antiplatelets could be aspirin, could be the uh, phenopyridines, and also the non-theopyridines. Uh, 
as well as uh, NSAs can be classified into the anti antiplatelet agents. So there is this uh, study, uh, which was called the bridging study, uh, preparative bridging of anticoagulants in patients with atrial fibrillation. There, there's a lot of studies that have been done on atrial fibrillation because atrial fibrillation is one of the commonest indication of chronic anticoagulation and therefore been studied, especially in this case where we need to bridge some of these anticoagulants preoperatively. So in the bridge study, it was a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial where patients on warfarin for atrial fibrillation requiring preoperative interruptions were, were studied. The bridging was done with daltaparin uh, versus no bridging of the warfarin. Uh, and the patients who are included in this study were 1,184 patients. The primary outcome that was being studied was atrial thrombosis and also major bleeding. And the secondary outcomes were death, myocardial infarction, uh, deep venous thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, and, and minor bleeding. And from the results there, you can see um, the only significant outcome was major bleeding and minor bleeding. Uh, in the secondary outcomes. And uh, from this bridging, bridge trial, we can actually conclude that uh, in patients with atrial fibrillation and a warfarin interruption for an elective procedure, no bridging is non inferior to bridging in prevention of arterial thrombosis. So these patients had no different, clinically significant difference in arterial thrombosis. And no bridging is superior to bridging with regards to major bleed. So the patients who actually underwent bridging had more bleeding compared to the patients who did not have interruption of the warfarin. So anticoagulation and atrial fibrillation studies, uh, like I mentioned, there are many studies that have been uh, studied for this. An example is the dresden uh, Nowak registry. And what was found in this is individuals undergoing major procedures were more likely to receive bridging. And these patients who received bridging were more likely to bleed than the patients who didn't receive uh, the bridging. Um, and by bridging here, we mean uh, bridging from warfarin using low molecular weight heparins. Uh, the, re the RELI trial, which was a randomized evaluation for, which is a randomized evaluation for long-term anticoagulation therapy, where they studied warfarin against dabigatran, and there was no difference in thromboembolic risk in this study. Uh, the emergencies, uh, of, of one of the other findings from this study is emergencies had more thromboembolic risk compared to patients who had elective surgery. There's also a study called Rocket AF, which was comparing rivaroxaban once daily versus the vitamin K antagonist in prevention of thromboembolic and stroke risk. And in this study, there was no risk between the two. Um, the Aristotle study, which is a pixaban for reduction of stroke and thromboembolic events in atrial fibrillation. Uh, in this study, warfarin actually had a higher thromboembolic risk uh, compared to a pixaban. And finally, we have the orbit AF study, which, out, which is an outcome registry for better informed treatment of atrial fibrillation. In these patients, uh, the bleeding events were more common in bridging, which is 5% versus no bridging, which is 1.3%. And I'm sure you've had a lot of recommendations about people recommending uh, avoiding bridging whenever it's, uh, it's not indicated or if, if possible. So the key questions you ask yourself uh, pre-procedurally when you're called upon to anesthetize a patient uh, who is on anticoagulants is one, can the anticoagulants be continued? Can the anticoagulants be discontinued? What is the thromboembolic risk of this particular patient? What is the patient specific bleeding risk? And what is the procedural bleeding risk? So these questions are what you have to ask your question yourself whenever you have these patients uh, uh, for your anesthesia. Is there a universal protocol for this? The answer to this, no. Most of these protocols are region-based, hospital-based, but the general principle is the same. So this is a schematic uh, representation, and, and this is also uh, from the IAST. Sorry. Uh, And this is just showing how anticoagulants, an example of how uh, the flow diagram of anticoagulants discontinuation can be done. And you can have a look, you can actually go through it. An example is patient receiving anticoagulants who require elective surgery. Uh, 
uh, which anticoagulant is the patient on. If the patient is on direct oral anticoagulants, uh, then you stratify them into minimal, low to moderate or high risk procedures. And therefore, you'll omit these anticoagulants differently based on this stratification of your patient. If this patient were to be on vitamin K antagonists, also you'll look at what is the bleeding risk of the procedure. If the procedure has minimal bleeding risk, then you do not interrupt uh, the anticoagulant. If the patient has low to moderate or high risk uh, of bleeding during the procedure, then you look at the thromboembolic risk. Like I told, like I said, it's always a balance between thromboembolism and uh, thrombosis and bleeding as you decide on whether to discontinue, continue, or bridge your anticoagulants. So this diagram is basically aimed at describing how you look at a patient and decide how, for example, you'll be bridging your patient uh, during your anesthetic, as you prepare for your anesthetic. And an example, I just use the three, two, and one to show that this would be a different plan uh, based on the risk classification of the patient. And so if you have a patient with high bleeding risk, at the same time, a high thrombosis risk, thromboembolic risk, uh, you probably will use this number three plan. And what this number three plan, for example, if a patient if was on warfarin, is you'll stop your warfarin five to seven days pre-op. And then on day three pre-op, you will start your IV and fractionated heparin uh, uh, thromboprophylaxis at therapeutic doses and stop this 24 hours before the surgery. And you have to check your INR to, to be sure that the patient has been reversed from the warfarin adequately to have the surgery. If the INR is still high, you can consider other factors such as vitamin K uh, doses to be given before the surgery. And then on the morning of surgery as well, you, 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 you check your INR. If your INR is acceptable, usually below 1.4, you can proceed with surgery. But remember, this patient is high risk for thromboembolism and also high risk for bleeding. And that's why we prefer the IV infusion of unfractionated heparin. And this will start in post-op around six hours, within 12 hours of post-op management. And after 24 hours, based on the bleeding risk of the patient at that point, you will consider restarting your warfarin at the previous dose. And at that time also, convert your IV heparin to therapeutic dose of uh, therapy, therapeutic dose of unfractionated heparin. Sorry, therapeutic dose of low molecular weight heparin. And then based on your INR titers going forward, you will stop your low molecular weight heparin and continue with, the, uh, with your warfarin. For patients who have very, very low risk of bleeding, uh, these patients don't require any stopping of anticoagulation. So you'll continue the treatment as usual. Um, for this, the rest of the patient, for example, here are patients with low risk of thromboembolic, low thrombo thromboembolic risk, regardless of the bleeding risk. These are the patients you'll stop your warfarin five days pre-op and start them on low molecular weight heparin at prophylaxis doses. And this will be done until 24 hours preoperatively. Check your INR before you go to surgery. And within 24 hours of surgery, you'll be able to restart your low dose prophylaxis low molecular weight heparin and do your, start your offering 24 hours later uh, based on the bleeding risk of the patient at that time. And then based on your INR, you go on and win off your, your, your low molecular weight heparin. The difference between the three and the two is while you're bridging with low molecular weight heparin, the, the two where we are talking about moderate risk of thromboembolism and moderate risk of bleeding. These are the patients that uh, you will bridge them with prophylactic doses of low molecular weight heparin using the same uh, concept that I've mentioned. So when you're looking at uh, dual antiplatelet interruptions preoperatively, uh, this recommendation here is from a study called the POSE trial, where they recommended that dual antiplatelet agents can be stopped two days preoperatively or one day preoperatively based on the bleeding risk of your patient. And remember how to score the bleeding risk is from the, uh, the scoring system I've shown you, and also from the procedural risk of bleeding. And this uh, intervals that were recommended in the, in the POSE trial were based on the assumption that patients had a normal kidney function. 
for patients who are receiving dabigatran particularly, because dabigatran has significant renal excretion, uh, creatinine clearance was significantly affecting the discontinuation of the dabigatran before the surgery, because uh, this drug accumulates in patients who have reduced renal function. So in, individu in the individuals who had venous thromboembolism uh, with pr within prior 30 days, dual antiplatelet interruption should be individualized. And this is where I say there are not international or universal guidelines on how this is done. Uh, but this may include placement of an, a temporary IVC filter or shorten the periods of dual antiplatelet, sorry, dual anticoagulant uh, medication interruption. So if you look at uh, vitamin K antagonist interruptions preoperatively, uh, the recommendation is we stop warfarin five days before the procedure. And in these patients, we have to monitor INR before the procedure. And, and INR below 1.4 is actually accepted for procedures. And if this is above 1.4, you can always uh, give the vitamin K dose and repeat the INR dose on the morning of surgery. In patients who this bridging is needed, for high-risk thromboembolic risk patients, like I've described below be, uh, before, uh, you start low molecular heparin at therapeutic doses three days before, and uh, you stop it 24 hours before the surgery. I think I've discussed when to resume. So other considerations uh, that you will consider when thinking about stopping or not stopping anticoagulation preoperatively, NSAIDs, whenever you have non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications chronically being used by the patient, for example, it will be under your discretion to weigh whether the benefit of discontinuation or continuing will, uh, whichever uh, benefit risk analysis will be done by you. Uh, for patients who are receiving aspirin, if aspirin is given for a separate indication, for example, a recent stroke, acute coronary syndrome, implanted coronary stent, this aspirin should not be stopped. What, what studies have shown is aspirin at higher doses, which is a, a cutoff at 100 milligrams, the risk of bleeding associated with aspirin is higher with a higher dose of aspirin. So you'll find a lot of studies uh, saying that with a low dose of aspirin, usually 75 or 80, below 100, uh, usually can be compatible with procedures, surgical procedures, even invasive procedures. So in the very high risk, patients for thromboembolic, if the, if the thromboembolic risk is transient, for example, patients who have had ischemic stroke within the last three months, you should attempt to delay elective surgery. So the perioperative venous thromboembolism recurrence rates in patients who have not been on anticoagulation is 50%. And patients who've been on warfarin for a month, the risk reduces to eight to 10%. And patients who have received warfarin for at least three months, you can see the risk reduces almost tenfold to four to five percent. So in non-urgent surgeries, uh, really we should try and delay elective surgeries until all these benefits of anticoagulation have been achieved. It is also advisable to delay elective surgery in patients with atrial fibrillation who've had inadequate anticoagulation in the preceding month. So it has been observed that among patients who with non-vascular AFib, with non-vascular AFib, over 85% of thrombi resolve in four weeks of warfarin therapy. So all this just go to show that there's benefit in uh, withholding elective surgery in these patients. So what if you need to do this as an emergency and patients are on warfarin? So one of the reversal agents of warfarin is vitamin K. Uh, fresh frozen plasma can also be used and prothrombin complex concentrates. The availability of these agents, uh, particularly the prothrombin complex concentrates, is unclear. I'm not aware if they're available locally. Uh, Dabigatran also has a reversal agent, which is idrarusimab. And the doses of how to give these drugs, if available, are available um, in literature. Rivaroxaban, apixaban, and edoxaban also have andrexanet alpha as a reversal agent and prothrombin complex concentrates can also be used in as needed. So uh, there's a lot of questions about IVC filters, who needs it, who doesn't need it, uh, should we use it more often? So the temporary IVC filter is indicated in patients with very recent, by recent to mean three to four weeks, and acute venous thromboembolism, 
who require interruption of anticoagulation for major procedures in which therapeutic dose anticoagulation will, will, will need to be delayed for more than 12 hours postoperatively. Now in these patients, example is patients who require neuroaxial anesthesia, uh, who will want at least the coagulation to be delayed for more than 12 hours postoperatively, they can benefit from a preoperative uh, IVC filter. In contrast, we have those patients who are on anticoagulation and they need minor procedures such as a CVC insertion, who may be, this may be performed by just keeping one dose of your anticoagulant. And in this patient, an IVC filter cannot be inserted purely for that reason. If a patient has a venous thromboembolic event that is more than four weeks old, and they've been on treatment for it, then there's no need for an IVC filter uh, preoperatively. Other clinical situations such as uh, prior pre pre uh, sorry, prior perioperative thromboembolism or high-risk thrombophilias are not routine indications for IVC filters. So um, when, when do we continue anticoagulation despite the surgical procedure? So the, in general terms, minimal bleeding risk surgeries, uh, we can continue anticoagulation uh, throughout the, the surgical uh, journey. Dental procedures, and this is strictly to one or two uh, tooth extractions, can be done without of disimpactions. And this is the guidelines from the uh, antithrombotic management in patients undergoing electrophysiology procedures. And this has been adapted also in the guidelines uh, that are given in the uh, Thrombosis Canada. Uh, cutaneous procedures uh, can also be done with continuation of anticoagulation. Selected cardiac procedures, and this uh, is a recommendation from the European Heart Rhythm Association, EHRA, recommendation as well as the BRUIS control trial, which found that patients who are undergoing implantation of cardiac implantable electronic devices, continuation of warfarin or heparin bridging, the outcome showed that there was a lower bleeding risk in patients who had warfarin continued as opposed to bridging with, uh, with heparin. So these are the, some of the factors that you'll consider when considering bridging of your anticoagulants. And uh, as uh, what I wanted to emphasize on here, other than the mechanism of action, uh, is renal elimination of warfarin is very low. So warfarin in itself will not be affected much by the renal function of the patient. Uh, but at the same time, there's a lot of individual variation in warfarin requirements uh, between patients. So the same dose might not be exactly the same effect in different patients. For these other medications, dabigatran, apixaban, rivaroxaban, and edoxaban, if you look at the renal elimination of the drug down there, you'll find that dabigatran is heavily dependent on the renal system for elimination. And therefore, whenever you have a patient on dabigatran and you're trying to assess the risk of your patient uh, anticoagulation, whether to stop or not, it will be important to calculate your creatinine clearance that can guide you on how long you need to stop the bigatran before uh, they can have their surgery. So the, <clears throat> if you look at the, the table down there, it's just the same thing I've been explaining about the bigatran, and this is the guidelines recommendations on how anticoagulation with the bigatran should be, inter should be discontinued. For patients with creatinine clearance above 80, uh, having low risk bleeding, they can with, discontinue the that we got on 24 hours before. And this goes, uh, the, the time increases based on either high risk procedure or creatine clearance of the patient. These recommendations are available uh, online. So you don't have to keep them in mind. So uh, the next uh, point I wanted to talk about is regional anesthesia and anticoagulants. And uh, anticoagulants and certain antiplatelet agents confer an increased risk of spinal epidural hematoma after neuroaxial anesthesia. And this is one of the most dreaded complications of neuroaxial anesthesia uh, whenever you have patients on anticoagulants. So if you look at the incidence there, uh, one in 18,000 patients will get uh, spinal epidural hematomas when they have anticoagulants and and, and they under, undergo epidural anesthesia. This is slightly uh, lower, the, the incidence is lower in spinal anesthesia patients where one in 158,000 patients will develop uh, uh, hematomas uh, with spinal anesthesia and anticoagulants. This risk looks quite rare, but if you compare this with patients who are not on anticoagulants, the risk of hematoma is as high as one in a million patients. So you can see the impact 
factor of anticoagulation on the risk of these hematomas. So risk factors of uh, spinal epidural hematomas after neuroaxial anesthesia include, and, and these are some of the things that we will easily assess on our patients. So patients who have bleeding diastasis will be high risk for this. Timing of antithrombotic drugs. Whenever you, you've planned your patient and had regional anesthesia, in this case, uh, while on anticoagulants, it will be very uh, prudent of you to know when to restart these medications or when to, how long you need to wait before you actually remove catheters. And, and this is one of the risks of typing antithrombotic drugs uh, as, a, as, a, as a factor of reducing spinal epidural hematoma. Difficult or traumatic or bloody placement of uh, the epidural or spinal needles is also a risk factor for the hematomas. Uh, spinal abnormalities like scoliosis, female sex has also been shown to be a risk factor and older age, because older age will have all those fibrosis of ligaments or scoliosis uh, over time. How do we reduce these risk factors? So the ways to reduce these risk factors is for patients who you are struggling to decide whether to give an epidural or a spinal, and you think there's a risk of a hematoma, then spinal is actually better than an epidural. Uh, using a smaller needle is also uh, a factor that reduces the risk of a hematoma and also avoiding continuous catheter techniques. Uh, in these patients. There is grade one C recommendation on avoidance of neuroaxial technique in patients using more than one antithrombotic medication. And this includes aspirin and NSAIDs uh, at, and that are actually in effect at the time of the procedure. So all these patients probably who are on chronic pain management and some of them are on, on chronic aspirin for whatever reason, and they're also on NSAIDs maybe for pain management. Uh, this recommendation, although there's not very good evidence supporting it, they strongly recommend that we avoid neuroaxial techniques in these patients. So warfarin and neuroaxial anesthesia. The recommendation is to stop warfarin four to five days prior. Verify INR, like we've already discussed before. Continue regular neurological evaluation until 24 hours after removal of the catheter. So with neuroaxial techniques such as epidural, at times we need to leave in catheters. The assessment of the patient will be until 24 hours after you remove the catheter uh, before you can actually uh, rule out your patient uh, for having a um, spinal epidural hematoma. If, doses, if the patient received a dose of your anticoagulants while the catheter was in place, you have to check your INR daily and remove it only when the INR is below 1.5. If your INR is 1.5 to 3, uh, the catheter can be removed with caution and ensure strict monitoring of your patient's neurological status until the INR is stable. Uh, if the INR is more than three, then you cannot remove that catheter until the reasons why your INR is high have been addressed. So you might consider reducing the dose of warfarin, for example, or consider looking at all other drugs that interact with warfarin uh, that can cause your INR to stay high. And that's there's a lot of drugs like that, uh, including some of the drugs that patients take traditionally and, and herbally. So when you're looking at uh, heparin and uh, anticoagulation and, and neuroaxial anesthesia, unfractionated heparin, you can either have unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin. When, when you have unfractionated heparin given for more than four days, it is recommended that platelet count has to be taken because of the risk of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia prior to insertion or removal of your catheters or insertion of your neuroaxial technique. IV infusion or low dose subcutaneous and patronated heparin. The recommendation is you have to hold it for four to six hours prior to neuroaxial technique with monitoring of APTT, which has to be normal or acceptable by your guidelines before you actually perform the neuroaxial technique. After the insertion of your catheter or removal of your catheter, you have to wait one hour before you can start the infusion of heparin and fractionated. If you're using high dose and fractionated heparin, the recommendation is 12 hours before and still monitor your APTT. And if you're using therapeutic dose and fractionated heparin, the recommendation is 24 hours prior to insertion of a neuroaxial technique and monitor APTT at the same time. When you're having low molecular weight heparin, and one of the advantages of low molecular weight heparin is uh, the pharmacokinetics are a bit predictable and therefore you don't need routine monitoring of the, uh, of the APTT. You delay 
24 hours after a traumatic tap. So whenever you're doing a neuroaxial technique and you get a traumatic tap, you cannot start your low molecular weight uh, heparin within 24 hours of the, of the traumatic tap. If you're doing therapeutic doses of low molecular weight heparin and the patient requires neuroaxial techniques, you have to wait 24 hours prior to the insertion and at least more than four hours post catheter removal before you restart your low molecular weight heparin. And this will be a good guidance, especially in example will be maternity patients where uh, they have, they've had CSS and they had epidural catheters in situ. So these are some of the guidelines that can be used in those patients, uh, either therapeutically or prophylactically. So dual antiplatelet agents, sorry, direct oral antiplatelet agents and uh, uh, regional anesthesia. Uh, dabigatran should be stopped five days prior. As you can, if you remember what I talked about dabigatran before was any time between three and five days, but with neuroaxial anesthesia, it's recommended that five days stoppage of uh, dabigatran. Rivaroxaban, which is commonly used these days, it's three days prior. These durations could be shorter in patients who are not receiving neuroaxial anesthesia. So the pause trial, like I mentioned earlier, had this simple uh, uh, description on how uh, discontinuation of oral anticoagulants is done. Either uh, two days prior for high bleeding risk or one day prior for low bleeding risk. So in the post trial, one of the outcome was major bleeding risk was 2% and uh, ischemic strokes was 0.5%, which is considered low enough uh, for these patients. So uh, the other thing is uh, antiplatelet, agent, uh, antiplatelet agents and neuroaxial anesthesia. And uh, some of the antiplatelet agents commonly used uh, in our setting is clopidogrel. And um, clopidogrel is a thienopyridine derivative. Uh, of note is there's a lot of drug interactions between this and CYP2C9 inhibitors, an example of a common drug that we'll see in our treatment sheets is omeprazole. Whenever you have Clopidogrel, uh, you have a patient on clopidogrel requiring neuroaxial anesthesia, you can hold it five to 10 days before. Uh, more towards 10 days if your patient is on dual antiplatelet agents, let's say with aspirin. Um, but if clopidogrel is there on its own, then you can do just five days. Uh, the other drugs that antiplatelets that have been uh, used as well, like tirofiban, aspirin, and NSAIDs. So for aspirin and NSAIDs, uh, the consensus currently and the recommendation uh, from the ASRA Society, American Society of Regional Anesthesia is low dose aspirin can be continued even during regional anesthesia. And NSAIDs, it's a risk benefit assessment from the physician, uh, but most times you can continue your NSAIDs even with the uh, uh, neuroaxial anesthesia. Uh, so this is just a schematic representation of how you can manage dual antiplatelets or antiplatelets with aspirin uh, when you have a patient coming to you, particularly for regional anesthesia. So um, for example, if aspirin is being used for primary prevention, uh, then these patients need stoppage of aspirin before they go to surgery. If the patients are having secondary prevention, the aspirin for secondary prevention, then it will depend. What do they, do they have, status, are they status post PCI? or they had coronary artery disease without PCI. If they didn't have PCI, then you stop the aspirin and proceed with surgery. If they had PCI, then you assess your bleeding risk of the patient. So if the patient is high risk of bleeding, then you stop your aspirin. Uh, if the patient is not high risk of bleeding, then you continue the treatment and proceed with surgery. Uh, in the emergent setting, then you just proceed with surgery as is, uh, but then you have to, to remember uh, some of the, uh, the, the, the products that you have that will you will need to be used in case for your patient bleeds. If your patient is having dual antiplatelets, in this case, aspirin and clopidogrel, for example, you have to assess your patients in two categories. Have they completed the optimal duration of dual antiplatelet agents and I, uh, or not? And you can look at this uh, table here uh, where it, it actually describes what will be considered as completed uh, optimized, uh, completed optimal duration of dual antiplatelet agents. So any patient within two weeks uh, post coronary angioplasty or patients within four weeks of bare metal stent insertion or within six weeks, or uh, six months of bare metal stent insertion or patients who are three to six months or less uh, from drug eluting stents or six to 12 months after acute 
coronary syndrome, these patients are considered to be inadequately optimized on dual antiplatelet agents. If this is an elective procedure, just delay that surgery. If this is an urgent procedure, then you have to stratify your patient again into low bleeding risk, high bleeding risk, and intermediate risk. For patients with low bleeding risk, you continue your, your meds and you proceed to surgery. For patients with uh, intermediate bleeding risk, you stop your dual antiplatelets and you don't need to bridge and you proceed to surgery. Patients who are high risk of bleeding, you stop your dual antiplatelet agents and you bridge these patients, usually with low molecular weight, therapeutic doses of low, uh, low molecular weight and you proceed to surgery. And this is the only situation where patients on dual antiplatelets will require bridging. So this is just a table, part of it is repetition on clopidogrel, uh, discontinuation prior to surgery, aspirin, you don't need to stop, NSA is the same. Fondopar uh, Fondoparinux, it's uh, 36 to 42 hours before placement of your neuroaxial technique. And uh, you remove your catheter six hours prior to the first dose of Fondoparinux postoperatively. Uh, so this is something that you can refer to uh, whenever you have your patients requiring Fondoparinux. In, in, in this case, Arelto postoperatively. So uh, one of the other drugs that is commonly used, especially now in patients in neurosurgery is silostazole. And the recommendation, if you have a patient on silostazole who requires neuroaxial anesthesia, you have to stop your silostazole two days before uh, placement of your neuroaxial technique. And you have to remove your catheter prior to the first postoperative dose of silostazole. So spinal epidural hematoma, this is, like I said, this is one of the dreaded uh, complications of neuroaxial techniques and patients who develop symptoms suspicious of spinal epidural hematoma. Like I, uh, from what I've said in the previous slides is these patients require strict monitoring of their neurological status. And if you have any suspicion of this, an emergency CT or MRI, depending on your availability uh, and the institution should be done. An emergency neurosurgical evaluation for possible decompressive surgery should be done. And studies have actually shown that long-term neurological outcomes is better for patients who are decompressed uh, eight hours within the onset of symptoms. So we'll, we'll go through uh, an example of a case. So there's a 79-year-old male coming for total hip arthroplasty. Uh, this patient is hypertensive is on my, uh, and has had mitral valve prosthesis and also has atrial fibrillation. Uh, he reports a history of alcohol use. He is currently on warfarin for the indication above, and his kidney functions have been noted to be normal. He requires neuroaxial anesthesia for the hip arthroplasty. So how do you approach a patient like this? So if you remember, we approach these patients based on bleeding risk, thrombosis risk, and then uh, whether you are going to bridge them or not. So in this patient, uh, the thromboembolic risk is high, and one of the factors that, uh, you remember the, 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 the table that I showed earlier, where a prosthetic valve is, uh, is actually one of the factors that, that will put patient in a high risk of thromboembolism. And this patient therefore will be a high risk of thromboembolism. If you look at the bleeding risk of this patient is also high, based on the Hasblad score of four, any score above three is considered significant for bleeding risk when you're doing the Hasblad score. And, uh, the procedural specific risk is also major because this patient is undergoing hip arthroplasty. Uh, and therefore in this patient, uh, this patient is a high risk of thrombosis patient and also a high risk of bleeding patient. If you remember the, 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 the table I had shown about thrombosis versus uh, bleeding risk, uh, this is a patient that will benefit from bridging. And therefore this is an example of a plan that they will have. So you'll hold your offer in five days preoperatively you start therapeutic dose of low molecular weight, heparin. Uh, the, the key here is therapeutic dose, three days preoperatively and stop it 24 hours prior to surgery. You have to check your INR on this day. And then if your INR is less than 1.4, you proceed to surgery. You restart your warfarin 24 hours after surgery if your hemostasis is adequate. Then postoperatively within 24 hours, you need to do your low dose prophylactic low molecular weight heparin and 24 hours later, if your hemostasis is achieved, you convert this from prophylactic dose to bridging doses, which is therapeutic dose of the low molecular weight heparin. 
then this patient will be has to be INR has to be monitored going forward until uh, your preferred INR, either 1.8 or 2, is achieved before you stop your low molecular weight heparin. A second example will be a 70-year-old male with non-vascular non-valvular atrial fibrillation, diabetic, hypertensive. Uh, if you score this child's VAS score of this patient is three, uh, the patient is all on dabigatran and requires a hemicolectomy for cancer. Kidney function is normal. So when you are scoring thrombotic risk again, from the history, the child VAS score of three will confer this patient to the moderate risk of thrombosis. Number two is the patient's bleeding risk. The bleeding risk will be high. One, because of the half blood score of three, like I said, three and above is considered significant for bleeding. And also the procedure, this patient is undergoing major intra-abdominal procedure for cancer. Therefore, the, there is a high risk of bleeding in this patient. Would you breed this patient? Considering the type of surgery they are having, they are unlikely to be uh, taking orally uh, immediately postoperatively. So, if the patient will be able to take orally early, then you don't breach them. If the patient won't be able to take orally immediately, then you breach them. So uh, a plan that is suggested for this patient is to omit the bigatran two days before the procedure. Uh, you'll have no breaching on this patient. You resume the bigatran postoperatively day two or three when the patient is able to take medications by mouth. If this patient, you are now clear that they won't be able to take this, then you just start your uh, prophylactic low molecular weight heparins postoperatively. So uh, if from this presentation, you'll find that there are a lot of requirements, a lot of guidelines uh, that, that, that are required. We are not expecting any of you to memorize that. It's just that to know that these things are the concerns that you have on your patient preoperatively or perioperatively. Uh, the Thrombosis Canada website has an online free clinical tool um, that is uh, frequently updated and you can input your patient clinical characteristics into the tool and they'll give you a perioperative plan on when, how to stop and uh, when to resume your anticoagulation. For those who have smartphones, there's uh, the ASTRA, which is the American Society of Regional Anesthesia, uh, applications that you can download at a small fee and this also can guide you on how to manage perioperative anticoagulation in patients, especially requiring regional anesthesia. So in conclusion, the general principle is the same about management of perioperative anticoagulation. The guidelines are different, uh, hospital-based and regional-based, and they differ slightly, but the general principle is the same. Stratify all your patients, so there's no hard and fast rule on clopidogrel is equals to stopping or bridging, or offering is equals to bridging. Uh, at least one thing that you can take home is always stratify your patients on thrombotic risk, on bleeding risk, and decide whether this patient will benefit from continuation of your warfarin, for example, or bridging. And the same applies to also antiplatelet agents. Uh, clinical judgment is still very key. Uh, I don't want a situation where your surgeon tells you it will be a minor change of dressing and uh, your surgeon ends up with the one, uh, the one you can see on the image on the side. So even as you're giving anesthesia to your patients, it can be good if you know how your surgeon operates and how honest they are about the risk of bleeding or interoperative changes to the plan. A lot of what data is coming out and also we should keep reviewing this recommendation. Uh, what I like about the ASRA and also the IHST guidelines is they keep getting updated. So you can always check for new recommendations. Uh, exercise caution and ensure strict monitoring of patients, especially on neuroaxial anesthesia and anticoagulation. Whenever you go to remove your catheters, make sure you've seen the tissue and seen when the last anticoagulant was given uh, before you uh, expose your patient to the risk of uh, uh, epidural hematomas. In this discussion, I did not talk about the routine postoperative prophylaxis of patients. And that's a whole huge topic that can be discussed where you talk about uh, therapeutic uh, prophylactic doses and also mechanical thromboprophylaxis. I think my discussion ends there. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ian Ondari, for your insightful and well researched uh, presentation.
Kindly allow me to ask our sponsors to give a short presentation of about 10 minutes, and then we go to the question and answer session. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Emily uh, Barmao Chimtai from Glenmark Pharmaceuticals. I'm a field manager, uh, Senora Division in Glenmark. Uh, thank you all for joining us in this uh, uh, meeting with uh, in conjunction with KSC. I want to say thank you. So uh, uh, I want to deep dive in my presentation. With Glenmark, we have a global presence of over 95 countries and with employees of 10,400 across globally. Uh, Glenmark has uh, 40, 11 manufacturing facilities in four countries. Integrated, we have filled over 164 process patents in USA, Europe, and Canada. Um, with research, Glenmark has uh, 13 innovator molecules in various stages of preclinical and clinical development. Um, introducing our enoxaparin injection, uh, uh, low molecular weight enox for injection, which is indicated for effective prophylaxis and treatment of venous thromboembolism in moderate to high risk surgeries. Uh, our LMW enox is available in 20 mg, 40 mg, 60 mg, and 80 mg. Uh, our low molecular weight is available in pre-filled syringes, which are uh, co uh, color coded. We have the 20 mg, uh, which is in white, uh, 40 mg, which is in uh, yellow, 60 mg, which is color coded in uh, uh, orange, and we have the 80 mg, which is color coded in uh, 80 mg. The 60 mg and the 80 mg, these are, um, uh, they are uh, calibrated. Uh, but for 20 mg and 40 mg, these are not calibrated. Um, in Glenmark, uh, we have uh, we are available in all leading hospitals. That is our LMW Enox. We are available in Nairobi Hospital, um, Mat, uh, uh, Mpisha Hospital, the Aga Khan Avenues. Most hospitals are available. Uh, we have uh, our prices are quite affordable to your patient. I have made it available to your patients. Uh, in all these hospitals. And also for the trade business, in, uh, we'll find the patient that may want to buy from the uh, open, open uh, market outside hospitals. Our uh, prices are quite affordable. Uh, for patients who may be in a hospital, in a hospital, who may need uh, to take Enox after discharge, we also have a program in Glenmark that we, uh, we, we can sell to them directly from Glenmark Pharmaceuticals. Uh, with this, uh, we have contacts that you can always reach. Uh, this, uh, we are we work with Glenmark. We have Mr. Bonface Jera. This is his contact. You can always reach him for this uh, kind of patients. Myself, Emily, that is my contact. Also, we have our colleague Miss Mona. That's her contact. You can always reach uh, uh, the three of us if you have a patient who may, who is in need of our LMW Enox outside the hospital, you can always contact us with a very reduced kind of um, uh, uh, reduced uh, prices. So with that, I want to end my short presentation. Uh, mine is just to ha have a, uh, uh, say that I was Glenmark as we enter into the, this field. Our brand name is LMW Enox. We have the 20 MG, 40 MG, 60 MG and 8 MG. So I want to say thank you. Uh, for listening to me and also for KC. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. Now let's add straight to the question and answer session. And uh, our first question is from Dr. Kevin Omani, who is asking, uh, are prothrombin complex concentrates better at controlling INR when elevated rather than giving vitamin K? Dr. Ondar? So thanks for the question. Um, Theoretically, yes, uh, but personally, I have no experience uh, with prothrombin complex uh, uh, concentrates. So probably that I'll leave to someone who has more experience with it uh, and whether it's better. Yeah, they've just okay. been alternatively as as reversal agents for uh, warfarin. Okay, thank you. From the Dr. Maxino Kelo, she's asking uh, why use IV heparin and not subcutaneous heparin in postoperative breaching? Uh, thanks, Maxine. Um, so the patients who are receiving IV unfractionated heparin, 
are the patients who are at very high risk of thromboembolism and at the same time at a very high risk of bleeding. The reason for this is with IV uh, unfractionated heparin, you'll give a very small dose to confer anticoagulation. And in the case of this patient is bleeding, then it's easy to reverse the effects of the heparin. And also once stopping has been done, it takes shorter time for the effects of heparin to wear off. Okay, thank you. From uh, Dr. Bati Kolang, he's, say, he's asking or he's saying that recently there was a patient with severe menorrhagia, secondary to uterine, uterine fibroids and uh, DVT on anticoagulation therapy. The decision was to find a way of stopping the anticoagulation and doing hysterectomy. As the team was still considering the way forward, the patient had a pulmonary embolism and died suddenly. What should the team have done in the hindsight? Uh, so uh, thanks, Dr. Alang, for the question. Uh, this and the answer will be purely my opinion. Um, this is a patient who had severe menorrhagia and therefore required very urgent uh, procedure to, to, to remove uh, the fibroids or the uterus for that matter. This is a patient who would have benefited from an IVC filter before the surgery and then go ahead with the surgery either by having to stop for two, three days uh, or whatever anticoagulant they are on based on the anticoagulant they are on and then have the surgery. But I think an IVC filter will have been the way forward for this patient. Okay, thank you very much. And then uh, Dr. Lee Nguk is asking, is there a role of pre-op lab testing in patients on antiplatelets or, or direct oral anticoagulants, uh, low, mon or low molecular weight heparin? We see in INR, uh, we see INR, PTI, APTT requests given em emphasis before surgery. So from, from, from my reading, it was a grade 1C recommendation to do these tests. So these are patients who've been on antiplatelets uh, prior. Uh, the recommendation was there, but the evidence was poor on uh, whether these tests should be done preoperatively for antiplatelet agents. I don't know if I, I, I answer him with that. Mm -hmm. And then from my uh, Geoffrey Kinara. I have seen I've seen a, I've seen patients done prostatectomy developing thrombosis post op and then he's saying do we uh, I think he's asking basically how or what I don't get it. um so uh, I'll try and answer the question as well uh, although it's outside the scope of this uh, uh, presentation this is a patient who we are assessing patient-specific postoperative thromboembolic risk. And it's not particularly a patient who's on preoperative anticoagulants. So patients like this, you have to assess things like ambulation, uh, reason for surgery, age of the patient, uh, and know if the patient will require therapeutic or even uh, prophylactic prophylac uh, anticoagulation postoperatively. So this is a patient, uh, the risk factors in this patient to develop the post-op uh, clotting will be uh, basically age probably because they're having prostatectomy, I'm assuming it's not a child, uh, probably because of a malignancy, uh, probably because they're elderly, they're immobile, and also having other, other risk factors for, for VTE. Yeah, because you think uh, down there, I was asking, uh, can we consider prophylaxis and how soon for this patient? So, like I said, this is a different topic, but uh, the prophylaxis yeah. needs to be considered very early. And these are some of the patients that probably will require even mechanical thromboprophylaxis intraoperatively. And as they go postoperatively, if they can't mobilize and all, you have to do aggressive thromboprophylaxis, uh, probably with low molecular weight heparins. And if the risk of bleeding, I'm assuming if it's an open prostatectomy with high risk of bleeding, then uh, probably you'll consider either therapeutic doses or even an infusion of heparin, at least in the early stages before the patient ambulance. Okay, thank you very much. I think you have answered him very well. But, and uh, Dr. Lee again is asking, in patients on preoperative, uh, pre-op anticoagulants, 
who end up bleeding in perihop uh, period. What is the role of bedside rotem to guide patients, patient blood management? Is it something we should have in our hospital? Uh, so yes, Dr. Lee, uh, I didn't come across it in my reading, but thinking about it, yes. Uh, blood management and also administration of blood should be guided. And if we have a tool that will be able to guide us which factors are missing or what needs to be given, it will help to have judicious, judicious use of our, our, our resources, especially in our low resource settings. I don't know which one is cheaper, having the Rotem versus having uh, the particular concentrates to be given. But yes, I think it has a role in the reparative period. Okay, thank you. From Dr. Victoria. Do obstetric patients who are uh, anticoagulated follow the same recommendations? So obstetric patients uh, postoperatively, I'm assuming this patient was not on anticoagulation preoperatively, will follow the recommended postoperative anticoagulation for obstetrics. And this is for patients, patients should have prophylactic low molecular weight uh, heparin postoperatively. Uh, and studies have actually shown that patients who receive, there was no difference in patients who received low molecular weight heparin less than five days postoperatively, and patients who did not receive it at all for, for as long as they ambulated. So I think the benefit comes with those who receive low molecular weight heparin for five days, at least in studies. Uh, but I think it will be unforgivable if you get a patient with pulmonary embolism uh, on day three postoperatively who was not on, on, on anticoagulation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, John Namunganga is asking, kindly, what is the best anesthesia for an emergency case with low platelets and IUFD? It depends on how low the platelets are. Uh, different uh, hospitals and guidelines have different levels, but I'm assuming if it's as low, like below 50, then I'll go with general anesthesia. Mm -hmm. I think we're almost done with the questions. Just a minute, I go through them, if they send. Okay, thank you very much. I think we have uh, had all our questions answered and uh, maybe I give a chance to somebody who can, who wants to, one or two people to say something about what we have been talking about, or if they have a banning, a banning, banning issue, or any clarification they would wish to do, to say. And for the people who are asking about the, the presentation to be sent to them, I would ask them to kindly look at the KSA website, YouTube, Facebook pages, because all the all the presentations for these webinars are usually downloaded there for your for your viewing. Remember all those the CPD points will be sent to the respective emails, certificates for nurses, clinical officers, or and non-locals will be sent to them through their emails also. And uh, we have, uh, you know, as you, uh, as you all know that we have a KSA virtual conference coming up on 18 to 20th of August this year, I would kindly ask one of the EC members, Dr. Nabulindo, to kindly uh, make an, 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 an announcement. Thank you, welcome. So good evening uh, or uh, good afternoon uh, to all of you. And thank you again for your continued patronage. Uh, as you see, the, post, uh, the poster on the screen is an invite for you to join us in the 28th KSA and the 8th CCSK, that is the Critical Care Society of Kenya Annual Conference, uh, coming up in just about a month. So the conference will be fully virtual, and uh, you can go to the KSA website for registration guidance, and also look out for our posters on the social media handles of Kenya Society of Anesthesiologists. You are all welcome uh, to this uh, very informative 
scientific conference. The timings have been made uh, easier towards the end of the day, so that even if you are attending to your clinical work, you should be able to join us. We also have uh, problem-based discussions and workshops. Uh, visit our website to see the timings and for instructions on how to join us. Thank you very much. And we hope to see as many of you as possible during that event coming in just a month. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any planning issue? I had seen somebody who had raised his hand, Emil. Can you unmute yourself, please? Final comment. <clears throat> okay, I think it's not there. So uh, our next webinar will be next week on 15th. And uh, invites will be sent and reminders sent. Thank you very much. Being no other business. I think our meeting ends at this point. Thank you, everyone, for your participation. Thank you. Bye. Bye.